Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. And this is the big book study. We're starting on page 25. At actually the last full paragraph on the page. But I'm going to read the paragraph before that. And the reason is so far in this book, we've read mostly about our problem, about alcoholism. We've defined the real alcoholic. We've talked about some of the struggles that the real alcoholic goes through and the thinking that happens when he's at his worst, ready to quit drinking. And uh, there is a solution. And we're going to talk about the solution tonight. That middle paragraph on page 25 says, the great fact is just this and nothing less that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences which have revolutionized our whole attitude towards life, towards our fellows, and towards God's universe. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. He has commenced to accomplish those things for us which we could not do by ourselves. So after spiritual experiences there, it's, it has a little asterisk. And we're going, we're going to read Appendix 2 a little bit later on tonight. But there's really important stuff there. Another spiritual experience is our solution. Step 12 tells us that. Step 12 tells us, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps, we try to carry the message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. So the key is having a spiritual experience. So we're going to find out what a spiritual experience is tonight. And the other thing there, it says absolute certainty. And that's a great thing in the time we're living in when nothing is certain. We're living in a world of uncertainty. Who knows what's going to happen when we finally get back to normal? Is normal going to be normal when the pandemic's over and we're not on Zoom and we're in real life meetings? What's going to happen then? What's that going to be like? And uh, we don't know. Uh, but we do know with absolute certainty that our creators are in our hearts and our minds in a way that's indeed miraculous. And everybody in this room has experienced that to some level. And it goes on to say, if you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there is no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, and the other is to accept spiritual help. So there's two choices. You need to continue being an alcoholic, and it's progressive, so no matter how bad you are right now, it's only going to get worse. And you can keep on drinking as long as you want, as long as you can, but your life is going to be impossible. And that's why we come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're not here because there's no good movies out there. We're not here because we didn't have dinner dates for the night. We're here because we're alcoholics and we need this meeting. And we need the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we need our instruction book, our textbook, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what we need. That's why we're here. So it says that we need, if we go past human aid, we can't get a doctor to fix us. We can't get a psychiatrist to fix us. We can't get any fixes anywhere. Then we need spiritual help. And this book will tell us how to get that spiritual help. This we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. So there's willingness and honesty needed. And in that paragraph before, is it's about being open-minded. We're going to have new ideas coming to us here in AA. We're going to have a lot of new ideas we've never had before, and they're going to take the place of ideas we've already had in our, in our mind. So we're going to have to get rid of some of our old ideas. They just don't work anymore. That's why we're here, is the way our thinking goes. No good. So we're going to have to get rid of our old ideas to make room for new ideas. And that's what a spiritual experience is. So we're going to talk about a guy who had a great spiritual experience. His name was Roland Hazard. He was a pretty rich guy. And uh, he tried to go to Sigmund Freud to get help to stop drinking. 
but Sigmund Freud was busy. He tried to go to Adler, who was the second best psychiatrist at the time, and Adler wasn't taking new patients. So he had to go to all the way to Switzerland and study with Dr. Young, Carl Young. And uh, Young realized that it took a spiritual condition to, you know, some spiritual experience to get you over the hump and get you to where you could, were able to quit drinking. He goes on to talk about Roland Hazard here. It says, a certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and a high character. For years, he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He had consulted the best-known American psychiatrists. Then he had gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of celebrated physician, the psychiatrist, Dr. Young, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden traps and springs that release was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. More baffling still, he could give no satisfactory explanation of his fault. So he worked, he, he literally worked for one year, 52 weeks in a row. He went to see Carl Young. He didn't drink. He got sober and he thought he had learned everything he needed to learn of self knowledge that was going to keep him sober. He'd been sober for a year, so he's going to stay sober. Well, he left Switzerland and went to Paris and got drunk. Boom, got drunk. So that whole year was a waste. He didn't really learn anything. So he returned to his to this doctor whom he admired and asked him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems Yet he had no control whatever over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was the great physician's opinion. Wow, that's bad news. You know, that's not good news for an alcoholic. And he continues, but this man still lives and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where other free men may go without disaster, provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. Some alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Let us tell you the rest of the conversation our friend had with his doctor. So now we're going to find out what the doctor said and how he described a vital spiritual experience that all, we all need to have a spiritual awakening that is sufficient enough to make us get sober and stay sober. It says, the doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I have never seen one single case recover where the state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. He said to the doctor, is there no exception? The doctor said, yes, replied the doctor, there is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are phenomena. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, ideas, attitudes, and emotions, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side, and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. In fact, I have been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement within you. 
With many individuals, the methods which I employed are successful, but I, I've never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. Again, we see the asterisks, and it says at the bottom, for amplification, see Appendix 2. So, let's take a look at Appendix 2. Appendix 2 is all the way in the back of the book on page 567. Bill is that great writer we've been talking about ever since we started going through the book this time. What a great writer he is. He tells stories about something you know about in order to teach you something you don't know about. So he kind of gets on the same level with you. He also uses another trick. He uses one word to mean something. But then he repeats that word, but it's not the same word. It's a different word that means the same thing over and over and over again. So you'll get the complete picture of what Bill's talking about. So in this in spiritual experience, Appendix 2, it says the term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. So there's the first time he uses the word change. Next paragraph, he uses it again. He says, yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impression that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. But again, he says personality changes. He talks about upheavals. When something is an upheaval, it changes. So he's talking about change the whole time here. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described. Though it was not our intention to create such an impression, many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook, or change again. Overwhelming. When something overwhelms you, it changes you. A revolutionary change. Changes everything. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, again, a word for change, so frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are of what the psychologist William James called the educational variety because they develop slowly over a period of time. Quite often, friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference, change, long before he is himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration, another word for change, in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource, which they presently identify with their own conceptions of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. Most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover, provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one need have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery, but these are indispensable. So there we go. He's talking about it back in, in there is a solution, talking about honesty and open-mindedness and willingness as being essentials to having a spiritual experience, and he brings it out again here. And then there's a quote by Herbert Spencer. It says, there is a principle 
which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, which cannot keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. So try it before you reject it. Try having a spiritual experience. Try to have that psychic change, that personality change that's talked about so much in the book. Try to have that before you say it doesn't work. Give it a shot. And so, so in the back of the book there, it talks about two different ways you can have a spiritual experience. One is the white light spiritual experience that we all have heard about. Many people in AA have had white light experiences that changed them on the spot. They were never the same after that spiritual experience. Some had it before they even came into AA. Some people had it right after they came into AA. Many people have it when they work step three, especially. They have that spiritual experience. And if not by step three, then certainly by step five. And they have a great white light spiritual experience that alters their life forever. However, many people just have the educational variety. And that works exactly the same. It's just slower. And it's just a little bit. You come to a meeting, you learn something you never knew before. You hear somebody talk and you do something different because they told you different. You, you try this, you know, do this and you'll feel better. And we keep on learning stuff in the meetings of AA. We get a sponsor. Our sponsor is going to help us read the big book, show us what the big book means. And we're going to learn stuff. And we're going to have to be open minded. We're going to get new ideas. And we're going to have to let go of old ideas. And that's hard to do. Sometimes we've had ideas embedded in us for our whole life and swore up and down that was the way it is. And then come into AA and find out that maybe that old idea is what held you back and what got you into drinking in the first place. So that's an idea you got to get rid of. You got to let that go. And then you're open to new ideas. You also have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to be open minded. My favorite line is, be open to everything, so listen to everything you hear, be open to everything, but attached to nothing. And if you're not attached to your old ideas, they're easier to let go of, and it's easier to let in the new ideas. So open to everything, attached to nothing. And it gives you a little bit of a freedom to change the way you approach things. So you can have the great white light experience or you can have the educational variety, but the doctor talks about another kind too. And this is what's important about having a sponsor. Is he says, in fact, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement within you. With many individuals, the method which I employed are successful, but I have never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. So <clears throat> someone else, can help you have that great white light experience. A sponsor can guide you into that. Can help you get in the right frame of mind, do the right things, pray, meditate, turn off the internal dialogue, and get a close relationship with your higher power. And at that point, you may have a spiritual experience. And uh, so the doctor said he had done it with many people. Couldn't do it with Roland Hazard, but he had done it with other people. So that's a possibility. So there's actually three ways you can have a spiritual experience. And we have them during the day often. You know, we have those God moments where we find ourselves a place that we wanted to be, but didn't know it was that. But we went there and there it was. And that's a God moment. That's a spiritual experience. A little one. But it's one just the same. You know, it might be that not be that giant white light experience, but it's an experience. There are miracles that happen in AA every day. People experience miracles all the time. And those miracles are part of your spiritual awakening. And I've had many little spiritual experiences that all join together and end up making up the spiritual awakening on all levels. And so it's just an accumulation of little God moments here and there. 
And if you get if you have a spiritual experience, stay in it. Whatever your thought is at that moment, keep that thought. I used to get excited when I had a little God moment. I couldn't wait to tell everybody. Well, when I went, got ready to tell everybody, it stopped happening. But I just enjoyed it. It would have lasted longer. And if you get them to last long enough, maybe they'll start bumping into each other and you'll be having spiritual experiences all day long. You now we can work towards that. So these spiritual experiences are, in fact, the thing that gets us sober. The spiritual experience if strong enough, will help us recover from alcoholism. Because the thing that it says here that, that God is doing things for us that we were not able to do for ourselves, I was never able to quit drinking. I had a white light experience before I ever walked in the door of AA. And from that white light experience, I've never had a drink. When my purpose for being on that bus was to come here and get a drink. But that never happened because the spiritual experience before I ever walked in the doors of AA took away the obsession for me to drink. And then I had to find out why. How did that happen? You know, I'm ready to get drunk and now I can't. I can't even find a bar in Fort Lauderdale. Something's wrong with me. So, I mean, it was amazing. But I never had another drink again. So the obsession to drink was lifted, plain and simple, in one second. Now, I came to AA and tried to figure out why. How did that work? What happened? What was that? Describe that to me. What does that mean? How is that going to affect my life for the for, you know time to come? And so I stayed in AA and understood that a lot better and developed a great relationship with a higher power, which I didn't have at that moment. I didn't have a higher power when I had a white light experience. I had it the second after a white light experience that gave me a higher power, but I had no description for it. I didn't know how to set, I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know what it was. In the moment, I thought I was having a stroke. You know, it scared the hell out of me. But when I realized what it was, then and I learned more about it, then I, I realized the value of it. And then I became willing to do whatever I had to do and honest. You know, no sense in lying anymore. And I had to be honest with myself that here is this thing that happened that got me sober and, and is keeping me sober. So now Roland Hazard has, a, you know, he talks to the doctor about this experience. So it's a spiritual experience. So he says, upon hearing this, our friend was somewhat relieved for he reflected that after all, he was a good church member. This hope, however, was destroyed by the doctors telling him that while his religious convictions were very good, in his case, they did not spell the necessary vital spiritual experience. So, religion is great. Churches are great. All the religions are good. You can go to religion all you want. You can go to a house of worship and worship God. But in AA, we don't worship God. We have a relationship with God. And that relationship is special. And it's different relationship you have in a church. And certainly, we're allowed to go to church. It's encouraged. So it goes on to say on page 28, here's a terrible dilemma in which our friend found himself when he had the extraordinary experience, which as we have already told you, made him a free man. So he did, in fact, have a spiritual experience. And from that moment on, he never had another drink. So that's the value of that spiritual experience. One way or the other, fast and immediate or slow, the educational variety, that spiritual experience will get you sober and help you stay sober as long as you keep a certain attitude. Always a caveat. In our turn, sought the same escape with all the desperation of drowning men. What seemed at first flimsy reed has proved to be the loving and powerful hand of God. A new life has been given us, or if you prefer, a design for living that really works. So this is a little bit of an explanation of how you feel when you come into AA. You're in AA, you walk into a room and you see a room of old men you know, you see people sitting around, 
You know, you don't really fit in. You don't feel good. You talk, sit in the back row. You try not to talk to people, but people are always talking to you. You know, the fellowship of AA is walking up to you and saying hello, and you're you're uncomfortable. You don't know what it's about. You know, I had no idea what AA was about in my first few meetings. And so you feel bad, and you feel like the help that you want and that you need at that moment is just flimsy. It's not good. What are you talking about? Sitting in a room, going to this meeting? How is this going to help me? And we seem a little dejected in the beginning. But if we just stick and stay, if we look around the room and recognize that some of these people have been here for a very long time, and they wouldn't be here that long if it didn't work, and they wouldn't they wouldn't be helping you out like they do if it didn't work, if it wasn't good. So we have to realize that this is a design for living that really works well, and it's actually the hand of God reaching down to you in these rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. The solution is in the rooms because this is where God is. The distinguished American psychologist William James in his book, Varieties of Religious Experience, indicates a multitude of ways in which men have discovered God. We have no desire to convince anyone that there is only one way by which faith can be acquired. If what we have learned and felt and seen means anything at all, it means that all of us, whatever our race, creed, or color, are the children of a living creator with whom we may form a relationship upon simple and understandable terms as soon as we are willing and honest enough to try. And there's that willingness and honesty I've mentioned again. So it must be important to be willing and honest and open-minded. Those having religious affiliations will find here nothing disturbing to their beliefs or ceremonies. There is no friction among us over such matters. We think it no concern of ours for what religious bodies our members identify themselves with as individuals. This should be an entirely personal affair, which each one decides for himself in the light of past associations or his present choice. Not all of us join religious bodies, but most of us favor such memberships. In the following chapter, there appears an explanation of alcoholism as we understand it. Then a chapter addressed to the agnostic. Many who once were in this class are now among our members. Surprisingly enough, we find such convictions no great obstacle to the spiritual experience. Further on, clear-cut directions are given showing how we recovered. These are followed by 42 personal experiences. Each individual in the personal stories describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. We hope no one will consider these revealing accounts in bad taste. Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women, desperately in need, will see these pages, and we believe that it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. What a great chapter. So that talks a lot about our issue, our problem, our disease. We're alcoholics. We do things we cannot explain to anybody why we do them. We can't even explain it to ourselves. We have no idea why we drank the way we drank. Yes, you can know already that it's an allergy, but that didn't stop you from having a drink. You can say, well, I've got willpower, and your willpower fails, and you just say, well, I'll, I'll do it better next time. I'll keep on drinking. There's nothing that stops us from drinking until we give in and accept spiritual help and have a personality change sufficient to help us recover from alcoholism. And we're going to go in next week. We'll start reading more about alcoholism.
At the end of that chapter, there'll be no more talking about alcoholism. We'll know everything we need to know about alcoholism. After that, it's all solution. And it talks about everything in the world that's good for our lives except alcohol, because we're going to learn everything. In this chapter, it's incredible. You'll find yourself in the pages of this chapter, on almost every page, you'll see yourself in there. So we'll pick on pick that up next week. Thank you all for listening. Barbara, back to you.